Several weeks ago, I began a series of messages on the questions challenging Christianity. And I started with such things as, how do you know there is a God? And have dealt with such things as, how do you know the Bible is reliable? And stuff like that. A lot of the questions are academic. As a matter of fact, when you think of the challenges to Christianity, you usually think of that kind of an academic or intellectual question. But some of the objections to Christianity, some of the people who question Christianity, aren't asking academic questions so much as just uh, maybe more emotional questions or personal questions. For example, uh, I've presented the gospel to people and had them say to me things like, oh, that's too simple. You ever had anybody do that? That's too easy? You ever had anybody tell you that? Uh, now, there are ramifications of that. There are other ways to say it, like, do you mean to tell me that you can get to heaven by doing nothing? I mean, that's what they say to me. Or they have said such things as, well, that isn't fair. You mean a bad person can go to heaven because they believe and a good person doesn't because they didn't believe? That just doesn't seem fair. Now, I could go on and on about this, but those are the basic kinds of things all revolving around the, Christ, uh, around the question of, isn't forgiveness by believing too simple? Now, what do we say about that? Well, here's what I'd like to do. I'd like to, first of all, establish the fact that the Bible says salvation is by faith. It's by simply believing. And then I'm going to take three of these objections, all revolving around the same issue, and speak to them. Now, the first part of this, most of you have heard me say, probably every other Sunday for years, <laughs> But I want to I wanna talk about it and I, because I want you to look at some passages of Scripture. And I want you to see it in the Scripture. Now, to start with, let me explain something. The New, the New Testament opens with four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. The first three are called the Synoptic Gospels because they are similar in outline and, to some degree, in content. The Gospel of John is radically different. As a matter of fact, it's different for a whole bunch of reasons, not the least of which is that in the first three Gospels, Jesus is up in Galilee. He was born in Galilee. He lived in Galilee. He ministered in the northern part of Israel called Galilee. The Gospel of John is almost exclusively in Jerusalem. As a matter of fact, um, um, we wouldn't know that Jesus' ministry was three years if it weren't for the Gospel of John. It's, we know that he went to Jerusalem for the Passover, and that was an annual event, and based on what we know in the Gospel of John, we know his ministry must have been three years. But there's another difference, and it's a major difference. I want you to turn to Luke chapter 1. Luke chapter 1. Many, if, well, most of the books in the Bible do not tell us why they were written. We have to figure that out by looking at the content of the book. But there are one or two books that tell us their purpose. And Luke is one of them. Verse 1 says, Inasmuch as many have taken in hand to set in order a narrative of those things which have been fulfilled among us, just as those who were from the beginning eyewitnesses and ministers of the word delivered them to us, it seemed good to me also, having had perfect understanding of all things from the very first, to write to you an orderly account, most excellent Theophilus, that you may know for certain those things which in which you 
were instructed. Did you see that? Would you say that Theophilus was a believer or an unbeliever? A believer. You've been instructed in these things, and many have written, but I have perfect understanding, mainly because the Holy Spirit was with him. And uh, I want you to know for certain those things you already know. So that's a clue. Now, Matthew does not give us his purpose. Mark does not give us his purpose. But Luke does, and since the three of them are so similar, we assume, based on their content, that they have the same purpose as Luke, namely to write to believers. Now turn to John chapter 20. John chapter 20. He gives a purpose statement. And look at it. He says in John 20, verse 30, many other signs in the presence of his disciples Jesus did, which are not written in this book, but these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you might have life in his name. Now, who does that sound like it was written to? Unbelievers. Ah, now we have a really interesting situation. Matthew, Mark, and Luke were written to believers. John was written to unbelievers. Now, with that in mind, look at the content of the first three versus the fourth. In Matthew, Mark, and Luke, we are hearing constantly about something called discipleship. If you want to be a disciple, you have to do certain things. Now, the word disciple means learner. So these books are addressed to believers. And if he says, now, if you want to learn about the Lord, now, well, there's some more things you've got to do. Uh, and they're pretty rigid. Like, hate your father and mother. Remember that passage? Ooh, you're supposed to hate your father and mother? Well, I, I don't have time to do this, but there's an indication in the book of Genesis that to mean hate somebody means you love them less than somebody else. And the point is, you need to love the Lord more than anybody else so that you're going to listen to him, not anybody else. And if you don't get that straight, you're not going to learn anything. And I hate to be the one to break you, this to you, but sometimes mother is wrong. You know, sometimes you listen and Patricia just put her hand over the ears of Victoria. <laughs> I, can, I can get away with that because I love them and they know it. <laughs> she did it. She did it. <laughs> All right. But the point I'm trying to make is you got to make the Lord the authority. And if you don't listen to if you don't do that, you're not going to listen to him. Right. He's got to be above the authority of everybody else, including you. Okay, so who's that to? Believers. believers. Now, what is the message to unbelievers? Well, I told in John 20, these are written that you might believe. believe. Ah, the one word to unbelievers is believe. believe. Now, uh, this is interesting. Uh, John 3, 16. God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son that whosoever... Find that in Matthew. Where's that in Mark? Did you ever see that in Luke? Can you think of a verse? No. Why? What's going on here? And the answer is that Matthew, Mark, and Luke are written to believers. There's very, very, very little in there about salvation. Oh, there is some. Rather... The Gospel of John is the only gospel and the only book in the Bible to tell unbelievers how to be saved. And the one word that's used to describe that is the word believe. That word appears 100 times in the Gospel of John. 
Not all of those are related to salvation, but most of them are. For example, John 1, 12, But as many as receive him, to them gave he the power to become the children of God, even to those who believe in his name. John 3, 16, God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. How about John 3.36? He who believes in the Son has everlasting life. And he who does not believe the Son does not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. How about John 5.24? Most assuredly I say to you, he who hears my words and believes in him who sent me has everlasting life and shall not come into judgment, but is passed from death unto life. Now, I could go on and on and on and on almost 100 times. In chapter 11, Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, shall live. And whosoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? Now, The single point I've made so far is that the book of John teaches that we have eternal life by believing. All right. One more interesting little wrinkle. The Bible seems to indicate in some passages you need to repent. I wrote a book once entitled, Repent, the Most Misunderstood Word in the Bible. Because most people hear the word repent and think that means you have to turn from sin. The word repent doesn't mean turn, and it doesn't mean from sin. It simply means to change your mind. I looked up every reference in the Bible to the verb and the noun, and passage after passage after passage indicates that. That's another subject for another time. The point is, it means to change your mind. It's like the word dozen. If I say to you, dozen, what do I mean? Eggs? Donuts? I heard somebody say context. Music to my ears. Right. If you're in a bakery, it's probably donuts. If you're on a farm, it's probably eggs. Context. Context. So the Bible does say you have to repent. Uh, Change your mind. And if you look at what you must change your mind about, it's things like who Jesus is. But here's what's fascinating. The word repent does not appear in the Gospel of John one single time. Not even once. That's incredible. Matter of fact, it doesn't appear there when it should appear there. Turn to John chapter 1. Let me show you something. What was the message of John the Baptist? Repent. Repent. Well, look what John says about John the Baptist. Look at chapter 1, verse 6. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. This man came for a witness to bear witness to the light that all through him might believe. believe. Would you look at that? Interesting. Matter of fact, if you understand... uh, The scripture, you can't believe without repenting. In terms of salvation, you can't repent without believing. They are different, but they are just really wound up and bound to each other. But the point is this. According to the gospel of John, what must I do to be saved? Believe. Believe. I want you to get that one word. Now, the second book I want us to look at is the book of Acts. And I want you to turn to Acts chapter 10. What is the title of this book? Acts of the Apostles, Apostles, right. How many apostles were there? Twelve. All right, Judas died, and he was replaced in chapter 1 by Matthias, so we got twelve. How many of the original eleven left are mentioned in the book of Acts? (coughs) Paul wasn't one of the originals. Peter, who else? James. That was another James. Different James. 
John. I thought it was I thought the title of the book was The Acts of the Apostles. Huh? That was a man made title. There are only two apostles, really, that are prominent in the book. The first 12 chapters have to do with Peter. The 13 to 28 has to do with Paul. And by the way, everything Peter does, Paul does. Peter casts out a demon, Paul casts out a demon. Peter lays hands on people, receive the Holy Spirit. Paul lands, lays hands on people, receive the Holy Spirit. To give Paul recognition that he's just on the same level as Peter. Ooh, that's an interesting little observation about the book of Acts. So there are only two apostles mentioned in Acts, Peter and Paul. I'm going to show you what both of them say. First Peter. First Peter is uh, in chapter 10. And I want you to look at verse 42. We're going to break in on the middle of a sermon. I said Acts, I'm sorry. Acts chapter 10, verse 42. And he commanded us to preach to people and to testify that it is he who has ordained by God to be judge of the living and the dead. To him all the prophets witness that through his name whosoever will receive remission of sins. That's Peter. What does Peter say you have to do to go to heaven or receive the remission of sins? Believe. Believe. Now let's talk about Paul. Turn to chapter 16 of the book of Acts. You know this verse by heart. Look at verse 31. They're in jail, singing at midnight. And they're no doubt singing about the Lord. And in verse 30, the jailer says, What must I do to be saved? And verse 31 says, They, that's Paul and Silas, said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved. And if the rest of your household believes, they'll get saved too. So, what does John say you have to do to have eternal life? Believe. What does Peter say you have to do to get the remission of sins? Believe. What does Paul say you have to do to be saved? Believe. Does that mean when you believed you're given eternal life, you're forgiven of your sins and you're saved? Yes. And there are 30 other things that one theologian has figured out happens the minute you believe. All right, one more. Uh, There's one book in the Bible that is written. uh, It's theologically. As a matter of fact, we get most of our a lot of our theology out of the Book of Romans. That it's uh, got more in it about theology than any other book, especially on the subject of justification. So I want you to look at a couple of verses in Romans. Turn to Romans chapter four. And look at verse 2. If Abraham was justified by works, he had something to boast about, but not before God. Do you understand? If you do some good things, you have every right to boast about that. Just don't do it before God, because it's going to have nothing to do to get you into heaven. Hey, other people might pat you on the back, but not God, because it's not by works. Next verse. He says, uh, verse 3, For does not the scripture say, Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. Wow. Uh, Turn to the next chapter and look at verse 1. Therefore, having been justified by faith, chapter 5, verse 1, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. So what must you do to be justified? Believe. Justified simply means to be declared righteous. Wow. You're given eternal life. You're forgiven of all your sins. You're saved from hell. And you're declared righteous all by faith. So, the issue is salvation is by believing. It's by faith. Now, before I go on, let me make a clarification. Believe what? Well, many years ago, I looked up all the references to believe in the New Testament, and I just, for the express purpose of seeing what it is you have to believe, and I discovered that there are basically four things. You need to believe that Jesus is the Son of God. 
You need to believe that he's a man, by the way. And you need to believe that he died on the cross and he arose from the dead. So all of that comes down to believing that the Son of God died for your sins and arose from the dead. The second question is, you, when I say believe, exactly what does believe mean? Well, it believe means you believe certain things are true, and embedded in the Greek word believe is that you trust that thing. <clears throat> so, the second question I want to ask is trust him for what? Now, I want you to turn to 1 Timothy chapter 1. 1 Timothy chapter 1, and I want you to look at verse 16. 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 16. However, for this reason I obtain mercy, that in me first Jesus Christ might show all longsuffering as a pattern to those who are going to believe on him for, you see the word for? Underline it. For everlasting life. For everlasting life. I've said to people, you need to believe in the Lord. And they say, oh, I believe in the Lord. You need to trust the Lord. I had a fellow tell me once, I trusted the Lord, I fell overboard, and I trusted him to save me. From drowning. When I say you must trust the Lord, I mean trust him for everlasting life or if you wish to be forgiven of your sins to be justified to be saved all those can be included but the point is this I am trusting Jesus Christ to get me to heaven how many times you heard me say that but what I want you to see is where the Bible says that, not me. Got it? If you just know John 3.16 and Acts 16.31 and Ephesians 2.8, that's too much. If you just know John 3.16, you got it, all right? God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son that whosoever, Believe. you got it. The Bible is very clear about that. It says it over and over and over again. Now, the only little distinction I want to make is that there's a difference between believing something is true and trusting for something. And the thing you're trusting for is to get you someplace. Simple illustration I've used many times. There's an airplane down at LAX flying to Hawaii. And I believe the plane will get me to Hawaii. But I'm not going to Hawaii today because I haven't got on the plane. Incredibly simple. You have to trust the plane to get you to Hawaii, and I'm not trusting the plane. Nobody bought me a ticket. <laughs> but the difference is I can believe that Jesus is the Son of God. I can believe that he died on the cross. I can believe that he rose from the dead and not go to heaven. Because I'm trusting something I do instead of something he did. Got it? So it's believing Jesus can get me to heaven if I trust him. It's taking him at his word. It's believing his promise. All those things are stated in scripture. Now, I just wanted to establish that this objection is based in scripture. I mean by that... That when people object, well, isn't that too easy or simple? Well, they're objecting to something that's in the Bible. And then they say things like, well, that's too easy. Or, you mean that's all you have to do? Or it isn't fair? Well, let me answer each one of those, all right? Number one, it's too easy. What's the answer to that? Well... It is, and it isn't. It wasn't easy for God the Father. He had to be separated from his son, who was going to die, of all things, for sinners. So, 
It's easy for us, not easy for him. Wasn't easy for Jesus. He had to be separated from his father. He had to come down to earth and die. As a matter of fact, 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, He made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. He not just endured crucifixion, he became sin. Think of that for a holy God. Wasn't easy for him. He was betrayed, belittled, beaten, nailed to a cross. Listen, folks, all of that's no vacation on a beach. So it wasn't easy for him. But it is easy for us. Matter of fact, uh, all you have to do is believe. But you know, for some people, that's not easy. Because what you have to do is admit you're a sinner. And you know what? I can tell you by experience as a pastor, there are a lot of people that don't want to do that. I mean, there are a lot of Christians that don't want to do that. You want to follow me around for a while. Talk to people and say, oh, by the way, you have some responsibility here. And they will make every excuse in the book. That's as old as Eve and Adam. Well, it's the woman you gave me. That's why I did it. It's tough for some people to admit they're wrong. It takes a little thing called humility. And most people are too full of themselves to admit they're wrong. So I tell people all the time, look, you want to go to heaven? You got to know you're a sinner. And they will start giving me all the good things they've done as if to say, I'm really a good person. Well, you may have done some good things, but the truth of the matter is the Bible says all have sinned. So let me put it like this. While it may not be easy it's simple. And that's my thesis. It's that it's simple to go to heaven. All you have to do is trust Christ. Now, let me illustrate. This is a little far-fetched, but bear with me for a minute. Let's suppose that somebody knocked on your door. And there stood a man who said to you, um, I'm here to give you your gift car, a Rolls Royce. Now, I've used this as an illustration before, and I have in my notes that a Rolls Royce cost a couple of hundred thousand dollars. I had a conversation this morning just before the service with a couple of men who knew about such things, and I said, by the way, what does a Rolls Royce cost? And one said $600,000. And another said, no, that's not quite right. It's only $550,000. And that's the cheap version. That the expensive one is just shy of a million. So suppose somebody knocked on your door and said, I want to give you a new Rolls Royce. And you said, I don't know how to put such a magnificent magnificent machine like that together. I, I don't know the difference between a drive shaft and a crankshaft. Besides, I don't have enough money to buy such a car. And suppose the person standing out there said, you don't understand. An expert craftsman has already put the car together and I have personally paid for it here are the keys. All you have to do is accept it. Now, is that simple or what? Now, you may be so full of pride you can't reach out and accept it, but it's that simple. Actually, it's that easy. You don't have to assemble it. You don't have to pay for it. You just have to accept it. 
And that is salvation. When somebody says to me, that's too simple, I think, great, they're beginning to get the message. You say that to me, I know it's beginning to sink in because that's exactly what I'm saying. It's what the Bible says. So that's the first one. Well, it's just too easy. Well, somebody else paid for it. That wasn't easy. All you have to do is accept it, and that's simple. But what about that objection that says, and I tell people, you mean that's all you got to do? You mean there's got to be something else? Now, I understand this one because our conditioning from birth is that you've got to do something. Hold your own bottle. Tie your own shoe. Make up your own room. Then you get to school. You want to make an A? Study. You do the prescribed work, you'll get a merit badge. I was once a Boy Scout and I had a ton of merit badges. I was taught you got to work for those things. They don't give you those things. And then you get a job. You want a promotion? You got to work. So ingrained in us is that in order to get something, you got to work for it. Matter of fact, we even have a slogan, nothing free. No free lunch, except at the Lindley Church. <laughs> so a person raised on the work ethic has a difficult time believing that there's nothing else you have to do. Well, there is plenty else that has to do, but Jesus did it. Mm-hmm. And that's the issue. Are you going to trust you or are you going to trust him? Let me illustrate again. I don't think I've seen one of these lately, but they used to have public drinking fountains. Are there public drinking fountains anymore? Yeah? Oh, yeah? Okay. Well, let me just tell you that anybody can go up and drink at a public drinking fountain. It's that simple. It's that easy. And there's nothing else you have to do. Just be willing to drink. Now, somebody else had to do something. Somebody had to dig a long trench to get that water to you. Somebody had to construct the fountain. All you have to do is drink. Now with that illustration in mind, listen to what Jesus said. On the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried saying, If anyone thirst, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture says, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. But this he spoke concerning the Spirit, uh, whom those that believe in him would receive. For the Holy Spirit was not yet given because Jesus was not yet glorified. Did you hear what he said? Just come drink. Just like going up to a public water fountain and taking a drink of water. Just drink. And the drinking is a figure of speech for believing. Now, what's that old adage? God helps those who help themselves. You ever heard that? I've had people say to me, the Bible says God helps those who help themselves. No, it doesn't. The Bible says, if you want to have any hope of eternal life, you must not do anything. You must believe. If you do something and you're banking on the fact that you did something, you're disqualified. Whoa. That's right. Why? Because it's trusting Jesus Christ plus nothing. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Now, one more. It's too easy. You mean you don't have to do anything? And the third is, it's not fair. Let me take that illustration I I just gave about drinking at the water fountain. 
You mean to tell me a good person can drink at that water fountain and a bad person can drink at that water fountain and both of them are going to get refreshed and renewed because they had a drink of water? And the answer to that is, yep. yep. Exactly what I was about to say. That's exactly right. Now let's put this in perspective. You see, the Bible teaches there's none righteous, no, not one. So from God's point of view, this is not a matter of a good person taking a drink versus a bad person taking a drink. It's a matter of, as compared to God, it's one person who's really, really bad and a person who's only slightly bad, but they're all sinners. So the answer is, yeah, it's not unfair. It's God's grace. And if it weren't for that, none of us would make it. Now, let me, let me tell you something. You ever heard of the fact there are degrees of heaven? Some are going to be rewarded and some aren't. Suppose I told you there are degrees of hell. Is Hitler going to have the same hard time as some others? Turn to Revelation chapter 20. Revelation chapter 20. There's going to be justice. You're either going to accept the forgiveness, eternal life, through believing in Jesus Christ, or you're going to be judged based on what works you did. Here's the justice you want. You want fairness? Here it is. Revelation 20 verse 11. And I saw a great white throne, and him who sat on it, whose face... Uh, the earth and the heavens fled away, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God. And the books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the, judge, the dead were judged according to their works by the things which were written in the books. Now, you see what's going on? This is the great white throne judgment, the judgment of unbelievers, and there are <clears throat> two books, two sets of books. One is a book, and then there's books, and the books clearly says, records their works, right? So here's what happens. There's a book <clears throat> of all those who trusted Christ. So first, we're going to look in the book and see if you trusted Christ. Mm, your name is not there. So now we're going to open the books and see all the things you ever did. And you're going to be judged according to your works. So there's fairness. Say it isn't fair. It's fair. Matter of fact, by the way, just as a footnote, <clears throat> all judgment is based on works. Christians are going to be judged based on their works at the judgment seat of Christ. Unbelievers are going to be judged based on their works at the great white throne judgment. And it's going to be fair. So the argument that this isn't fair is not a biblical concept. Matter of fact, the Bible says, will not the judge of all the earth do right? It's in the book of Genesis. So, all these objections that it's too simple, that it's too easy, that it's not fair, that there's nothing else you have to do. Fade, evaporate in light of the word of God that says, all you have to do is believe. So you can take God at his word, or you can believe your reasoning. Which is it? I wouldn't trust you if I were me. You see, some things are only available as a gift. You can't get them any other way. If I were to own a high-rise apartment in downtown Los Angeles, somebody would have to give it to me. Because there's no way I'm going to buy a high-rise apartment in downtown Los Angeles. There isn't quite enough money in my checking account. <laughs> so how do I get it? Somebody gives it to me. Somebody with a lot to give. That's what makes this so fair. God is willing to give it to everybody. 
That's the answer to the fairness issue. All you have to do is trust Christ and you get, we've seen it today, everlasting life, forgiveness of sins, you're you're saved and you're justified, and that only begins the list. So, by the way, somebody's going to say, yeah, but, you know, the rich man bought it. Well, my illustration wasn't perfect. But the point I'm making is it's a gift and it's available to all. So, since Jesus Christ paid for sin, salvation is as simple as trusting him to get you to heaven. You can't work your way to heaven because he's already done the work. And your work, by the way, isn't sufficient. All right. Have I made the case? Yes, you have. Here's the word. You're, you're equipped now to tell somebody who says this. What, ver- what one verse do you have to know? John 3.16. I'm a happy scooter. People who say it's too simple simply don't understand the situation. So let me put the whole thing like this. Suppose you were on the fifth floor of a building... And the first couple of four floors caught on fire. And then the fire department showed up, ran up a ladder to the fifth floor with a basket, and said, get in the basket. Now give me all your objections, please. (laughs) Oh, that's too easy. I mean, you mean that's all I have to do? It's not fair. Oh yeah, there's a basket at every window. Get in. You can imagine someone in that situation saying, you mean all I have to do is trust the basket and I'll be saved? No, I don't want to do that. It's too simple. I'm going to depend on myself. Ridiculous. And that's just how ridiculous Ridiculous! Some people are objecting to the simple grace of God that salvation is by believing, period. Let's pray.